Happy, happy Monday, everybody. So excited to join you for another week with an amazing artist. Today, we are going to be chatting with Steph Littlebird. So if you haven't already followed her Instagram, you better get on that train because her work is amazing and eye-catching and awesome. So Steph will be joining us soon here in just a moment. In the meantime, I am Sarah Kryaski. I run our weekly Instagram live chats and um, have done some other work with the Art of Ed, including some writing and um, fun things along the way. And I'm also an elementary art teacher. I see Steph is in here, so she'll be joining us in just a second. Now, friendly reminder for y'all, as she joins, you are welcome to type any um, into the chat um, that you'd like to ask her or any questions along the way. Steph is going to be here. <gasps> Hi, Steph. Hey. How's it going? It's going very well. How are you? Good, good. We're super psyched to chat with you today, and we're going to just get right into it. <laughs> Yeah. So I see you have some of your work by you. Can you just kind of give us like a little background about um, you as an artist, as a person, as a human? Just tell us a little bit about you first before we dive right in. Yeah, so uh, I am a, a professional writer and artist. I am also an indigenous person. I belong to the uh, Grand Ronde Confederated Tribes of Oregon, and I am specifically of the Kalapoyan and Chinook Tribes of Oregon. Um, and so, yeah, I make a lot of work about my heritage and about uh, my community, that my contemporary community, as well as about our history. And um, I also write about technology for my professional life. So I do a little bit of everything and just like love to make art and collaborate with people. So that's, those are the things I like to do day to day. Nice, nice. I love it. I feel like that's, I mean, it's like a good balance, right? Because you kind of get to have like your hands in a lot of little, little places, but it can sort of evolve into what you want to do as an artist, which is what makes art so amazing. So let's talk just a little bit about if people haven't seen your work. Um, I have a couple prints, which I'll grab in a second here too. But I know you have this really beautiful, bold, clean style. And we're talking today about how you're kind of mixing that more traditional indigenous art with a more contemporary style. So can you explain a little bit about your process? Do you work digitally? How do you pick your colors? Just tell us a little bit about how you actually create your work. Yeah, so um, uh, much of my work, like I said, is inspired by my culture. And so part of what that means is that I actually practice a, a traditional art form, which is called form line. And most people would be familiar with that uh, if you were to think of totem poles. And so there's a geometric system that's involved in creating those, which is replicable in many mediums. And so I use that system in my work, but I give it a contemporary twist by making it digital and also um, breaking apart that formula and sort of reconfiguring it to make my own versions so uh, yeah I like the idea of being influenced by the past which I think most indigenous people are very much informed by their their personal and community history and um, so incorporating that and also incorporating my own unique perspective with color which um, color is also inspired by the community if you've ever been to a powwow all you see is neon colors everywhere and lots of reflectivity. And so my work is very much a reflection of contemporary powwow culture. And so mm -hmm. uh, there's certain color combinations and all kinds of things that are coded in color. And so um, if you are not a part of the community, you might not notice that, but you'll still think it's really beautiful. But the colors actually do have ties to the community as well. Yeah, well, I guess what to piggyback off of that, I'm not familiar with the connection between colors and, and traditions or anything like that. Can you tell me, like, maybe what are some of your favorite kinds of colors to use that mean something special to you or your community? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> the first color combination that I ever learned was um, that's the most important, at least in uh, Pacific Northwest tradition, which is the original colors of the totem pole would have been red, white, black. And then um, when we began to, in, to interact with French traders uh, from, uh, from Canada, we mm -hmm. actually incorporated teal. So mm. red, black, white, and teal is my favorite color combination because it's really eye grabbing. And then also as a reference to tradition, but tradition mixed with trade and um, the evolution of a style essentially so yeah colors color has so much history depending on what community you're in and so yeah um, you know the colors very much um 
inform my work just as much as the lines themselves. Yeah, that that's that's awesome. I love hearing too just about like your personal, what are you sort of drawn to? Like what are you always gonna be like, I kinda always wanna use this color, I always wanna use this, right? Mm -hmm. It's 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 your your vibe, your aesthetic, the things you're most drawn to as well. I think there was I want correct me if I'm wrong, maybe like a wolf um that we posted that you have like black and white and red and teal in it. It's this like really beautiful on a wood piece. So that might be a similar kind of style to those favorite colors you're talking about. It's yep. amazing and gorgeous. Um, so can you tell us just a little bit, you said you work digitally a little as well. So um, I have some prints of yours that are so crispy clean, but you also do work on wood typically and, and create in a, a more hands-on like classic approach I suppose can you tell us kind of how you get that more like crispy clean line because if you haven't seen Steph's work y'all it is like it looks like it's printed it's insane it's so cool so can you tell us like how how you do that and how you learn to do that yeah I mean it's a lot of trial and error I'm 36 and I went to art school when I was like 28 so I had been painting before that and experimenting with paints and then Basically, I just kind of stumbled upon this combination of um, paint with paintbrush and mm -hmm. getting that clean line really is all about your materials. So I use a very specific um, brand and type of paint. It's called uh, Golden High Flow. And mm -hmm. it's like water, basically. And it's probably, I mean probably airbrushers would use this. I know a lot <laughs> of the uh, paint pour people use this stuff. Ooh, but, yeah. Um, if it's very similar, if you are a sign painter and you're working in something called one shot, which is very thin and viscous so that you can get really nice lines. So yeah. basically I just figured out a way to do that with acrylic. And nice. um, I just love acrylic because it, I, it can work so fast in it. Uh, but yeah, really it's about the fluidity of your paint and making sure it's like really can, can go really fast. And then um, I religiously use Princeton liners. So um, they're a very long, <laughs> you know, it's very long, but man, um, when you're using it, it just creates a beautiful line and you can get them in all these different sizes. So you can make big lines and little lines, but um, I, I swear love it. These. I swear by liner liners, but specifically <laughs> Princeton. So yeah, um, it's really just about your materials and then, you know, practice, you know? Yeah, so totally. I, I <laughs> honestly, so I'm going to get hung up a little bit on that, like the tiny skinny paintbrush. So I don't know about everybody else, but sometimes those freak me out. Cause I'm like, in a in a in an interesting way where I'm like, man, I'm not I'm gonna wiggle. It's gonna be, you know, you gotta get this sort of beautiful balance between like how quickly you have to work. So I know it's magical, but I'm just picturing putting a bunch of those liner brushes in like some kindergartners' hands and just seeing them <laughs> try to make lines. Um, That's a whole nother I mean story. in a in a fun <laughs> in a fun experimental sort of way, right? Of course not laughing <laughs> disrespectfully. But in the way that it would be really interesting because the brush type and the brush shape and the brush style is so indicative over what that painting turns into. Right. And I think that's very clear by your work, Steph. Um, that makes total sense. Awesome. I see a couple other quick questions in the chat that I want to make sure I get to. Um, I know my friend Joel asked, he said, um, as far as the significance of the, the teal um, integrated or like that that kind of initial color combination you were mentioning. Can you tell us if there's a specific significance to that um, in regards to why you choose it in your work? Yeah, uh, so teal, like I said, wasn't uh, wasn't a part of our palettes until we started trading with uh, French Canadian fur trappers who were coming down um, th just basically along the Pacific Northwest um, to trap and take them back up north. And so um, with them, they brought uh, dyes. And so there was a very specific color dye called cornflower blue. And it's basically mm -hmm. kind of like a tealy blue. And um, the totem makers at that time just went nuts for that color. And it just it um, became incorporated into um, the palette. And it honestly, mm -hmm. it complements the red so well, and it makes the colors yeah. like pop in a whole different way. And so Buzz, yeah, it, it's magical, honestly. I, I love um, <laughs> triadic colors because they do vibrate your eyes differently if you mix warm and cool together the right way. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah, completely. And I think that's um, especially just like all the blending that happens in your pieces and the color choices are so um, bold. It's awesome. Which one of the other questions we see in the chat here was, do you have any pieces you can show us? So if there's anything you could just hold up for us. Otherwise, give me like four seconds and I'll show you what I have. Hold on. I was all, give yeah. me a second. Hang on. <laughs> We're gonna, we're so prepared. Okay, so these are a few prints that I'll show you as Steph is running. These are some of her amazing, this is part of her Three Sisters collection. Um, so she's got these really, really beautiful kind of thick and thin lines, which I believe, are these digital? Um, yeah, and I'm actually painting that one right now. Oh, yes! <laughs> so I'm making it real and taking <gasps> it from the computer. That's so amazing! I'll be oh working my gosh. on and that one this week. I. I love the the little sister um, piece. Here's another painting. Um, this is a drum. So this is part That's of the beautiful. form line style. Uh, this is like a classic form line eye here. And so, yeah, I just love to take colors that people are scared of and put yeah. them all together because they, <laughs> that's what regalia looks like. And it is just the most incredible visual experience to go to a powwow because of all the colors that you will see there. And so um, harnessing the power of color for me has been a goal of mine for as long as I can remember. And so I feel, I feel good that I'm known for that now just because oh, yes. I don't really like desaturation I only like bright stuff so <laughs> yeah I understand completely <laughs> I vibe with that for sure you know and there's so many beautiful ways to do it but like it's really cool once you find your style and you're like I just love that hot pink right or yeah. I love you know that's awesome um your work is beautiful everybody's saying they love those colors quick question about the digital work what um what program do you use for your digital work so um depends on what I'm doing um if I'm doing illustration stuff, like the stuff that you just showed, I just use my iPad and I use uh, the program is po called Procreate. And Procreate yep. is $9.99 for the entire life of your, you know, drawing abilities, which is forever. So um, <laughs> $9.99 is really cheap, especially if you've ever used digital programs for a drawing. Like Adobe is a billion dollars. So Procreate lets you do a lot of things that Adobe Illustrator and some of what Photoshop would do. It's just not a vector program. So if I'm working in vector, then I'll do Adobe Illustrator stuff. But I love Procreate because for the most part, you can design poster size or you can design web graphics, whatever you want. So right. um, yeah, highly recommend it because it's really intuitive too. Yes, yes, exactly. And I know um, we've been having in past conversations, just encouraging other art educators and teachers and humans to just keep creating because we can use that as sort of a therapy. And the nice thing about digital work is that you don't need really many materials. Of course, yes, you need a, a digital program and a, and a tablet. Yes. But aside from that, it's not a matter of getting out your paint and your paper and everything. So if you haven't experimented with digital creation, it can be a really fun outlet that is just grab your iPad, tuck it in your bag, and then you're, you're sketching away, right? And it's so easy to undo and, and, and change things around, right? Yeah, it's um, um, liberating and it doesn't cost you anything, right? Like once you have the program, you don't have to worry about right. wasting paints. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You can make a thousand copies and nothing, can, nothing will stop you, right? Yeah, I call it um, art okay. junk food. It's like candy. Like, I can just make a bunch of candy with it. <laughs> oh, I love that. It's art way junk faster. food, right? <laughs> I find myself doing that, too. I'll be like, make a copy, make a copy, change this one, change this one. It's it's a little addicting, so. Yes. <laughs> Instant gratification. Yes. Um, okay, so let's just talk a little bit about the art education side, right? A lot of our viewers are art teachers. Um, we work with students ranging from kindergarten all the way up to college, right? There's, there's so many... Um, individuals that we see especially either hybrid or virtual or in person right now and I'm curious if you can tell us just a little bit about um first of all maybe your experience with art growing up um and and maybe just piggybacking off of that a little bit to tell us why you think it's important to be um discussing art and many styles of art um in art education yeah so I will just say to all the art education people who are listening right now Thank you so much for the work that you do because I have had my life saved by an art educator actually multiple times. So art educators from K all the way up through college absolutely are doing like integral, important work and people don't appreciate it. But I believe that art um, is a way to teach 
critical thinking skills and to really actually develop um, a child's uh, self-esteem. I know that is yeah. what helped me to like develop a sense of worth when I didn't grow up in a great environment, basically, that like helped me do that, you know? And so um, art gave me a place to express myself and really grow into a person that I can be proud of. And so, yeah, I think that art education people are just like, the most important people in the world and no one <laughs> no one really knows that or admits it but I know it because I've experienced it and so I just thank all of you for that and so yeah I just thank you Steph yes I, from the collective we that means so so much to all of the educators who feel like we're like oh my gosh right now but it's important and we it know it's important is. it is important and um while the skill is undervalued it is it is unmistakably important if you want to be a, like an innovative person, if you want to um, think outside of the box. Creativity can help you do that, even if you're a mathematician, you know what I mean? Like creativity yeah. can help everyone. And so I love it so much. I try to support teachers however I can. I visit classes constantly and talk about my work and um, talk about indigenous art. So. Yeah, for me, um, I almost went into art education, but basically I just realized how hard of a job it was. <laughs> <laughs> we and can I was still like, I don't know if I can do it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was well, like, we'll help we'll, teachers. <laughs> we love it. We love it. We need it. We need help. We need the love, the support. You're still just as important and uh, inspirational in this role, Steph. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm sorry if the leaf blower guys are like right below my window right now so I'm you're good I, I think we can still hear you okay you're you're okay. good <laughs> um okay so you did mention that you go to classrooms when you could right and you you would kind of have conversations with students and and chat with them about what it's like to create your work and and answer questions that they might have so either maybe a, a conversation that you have had recently or one that you just really remember um talking to students about can you just tell us about some of those discussions with students yeah like, I mean, what do they ask right man well the thing is is especially as an indigenous person who is um in the sort of vein of making art that is educational in some way um mm -hmm. I, I i have to field all kinds of questions it could be you know an elementary student who's like like has no idea anything about history and um, right. all of those things all the way up to college students who still have no idea so um you know honestly i answer questions from like uh here's a perfect example i'll never forget this we were asked at the museum when we did the exhibition on my tribe um if native americans had cell phones and so um that to me reveals a lot about the education system and how it positions Native Americans as being mm -hmm. um, something that exists in the past. And so right. a, a lot of my work is actually really centered around this idea of creating um, an awareness about contemporary Indigenous culture because we are still here and we yes. are still um, living amongst you in your communities, we're your neighbors, we're your friends. And so um, a lot of my work is really about that and, and coming at it from many ways. And so I answer a lot of questions that are really just base level stuff. Um, I talk a lot about appropriation as well and um, the, uh, you know, the do's and don'ts of those things. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> okay. okay, so we're gonna we're gonna dive into that a little bit because I think that's important for art educators to, if nothing else, just kind of reflect and think about it individually as yourself and sort of just think about how you're addressing things within your classroom. Um, as we know, there are many ways to approach how you teach a lesson, how you teach about an artist, how you incorporate um, inspiration. But there's there's certainly a, uh, a negative connection or there can be with um, indigenous art, right? And, and the cultural appropriation that comes along with that, unfortunately. So Steph, can you tell us, um, I guess some of your do's and don'ts, right? What what would you tell to art teachers or students or artists that can give them some a little clearer path on how to be respectful um, when when creating work? Yeah, no, I think it's a great question, and it's a question that comes up, and I think that what it reflects is that people care and they just don't really know how to go about it, and so this is actually a great rule of thumb for any any type of. Um, learning about something and then you know making something about the thing which yes. is that 
you can you can make work about something that you learn no matter what it is without it being a copy of the thing that you learned about so uh -huh. um, what i say to to um teachers who are delivering say like a lesson about indigenous art and they're talking about maybe basketry or something then what you do with your students is you ask them to identify things about the object that are ob observe you know observationally sort of apprehended real easy it's kind yes. of like being in art school this is part of critique right so somebody every every week you got to get your art critiqued by your classes right so you bring mm -hmm. in art and you just have to hang it up and people are supposed to observe it and tell you what they think of it without any pretext right and so right. the observations is where you figure out like what to teach so when when people look at my work and they want to say make art inspired by my work there are ways to do that without yep. copying like right. say the form line style so what you would do is say okay well the form line style has geometry in it it also has patterns <laughs> uh -huh. it also has um three it has a triadic color scheme so how can you take those bits and and deliver a lesson where you also teach your students about color schemes I've got color theory or geometry or pattern making you can yeah. you, you can you're looking for the underlying commonality and then doing that without copying right so yep. It, it's yep. really just about finding the essential qualities of something and then focusing right. on that if you want to make art about it so yes. yeah I, yes it's it's tricky, but it's, it's a, there's a way to do it without copying. And that's really the, yeah. I think the biggest qualm that most native people have is just don't copy, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I think you're right. Cause okay. Let's say I, I showed my students your beautiful creations, right? Your work. Then we can talk about what we see, what we observe in you as a working artist, and then break it down to say, okay, well now how can we take that a step further and create something that now inspires us? represents us represents maybe what we see or observe or question and i love how you're it's like I'm trying to think of a good analogy like unpeeling an onion or whatever right it's not about the the image necessarily or about like making it look exactly like the other creation but it's about that bigger like compelling why why are they creating it what's in common what is the like the glue that holds it together right exactly yeah yes. i mean honestly and that's what's cool is that all of those things like geometry and patterning and color theory they belong to everybody yeah right? so those are things that everyone um as a human being inherits and so that's where that's where the lessons come in you know and so yes. you know you just have to just have to give it a shot and it'll work <laughs> now steph can you just tell us um you know for example, when we're creating work as art educators and we're trying to find different inspirational, uh, you know, cultures and, and ways to show our students that there is so much work in the world, um, do you feel that, like, let's say, for example, we were going to use your work as an inspiration in our classroom, show our students there are current working contemporary artists. Can you tell us maybe um, some other individuals or styles or... Um, contemporary indigenous artists that are working that you think would be really cool to incorporate into their work like into this discussion oh, yeah. i mean i'm all well, now that you asked me that i'm gonna have like a million no i know i was like maybe <laughs> i threw this i threw this question on you a little bit because now i'm like all all excited i'm like oh the more you show the more we 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 demonstrate for our students that it is a breadth right it is yeah. not a copy because it's one but it is so many yeah. right yeah, well, and that's the thing is that I, I always think about um, the regions, too, because depending on where you come from, there are going to be unique styles to that region. So, like, Pacific yeah. Northwest has its own style. And then, um, say, like, the woodland, which would be the sort of upper Midwest, a little bit farther east, like, they have the woodland style, which is this beautiful floral style. And mm -hmm. um, then you have the Southwest styles, you know? And so there's so many different people that you can, I mean, m one of my favorite artists uh, that is a contemporary artist is Deanna Bear. Um, and I, I'm, done, I'm like, my brain is going to fart right now on her screen. You're good. But like, there are so many indigenous artists. It, it's just crazy. Go look up, you know, native artists hashtag. And yes, yes. Like, there's just a million of them. So, yes. Um, 
And it really depends on what kind of art you like. If you like paintings or you like beadwork or, mm -hmm. you, I mean, like there's just so much. And so, um, or, you know, even the traditional carvers, there are so many remarkable carvers like um, Jerry Sheena and, um, Man, there's just so many people that like my brain is exploding trying <laughs> no, to you're narrow good. it down. You're good. So, my, I would just just, just, just just go look, just go look. Yeah, you're right. You're right. And and that's that's kind of part of why we're talking today too is because not only to bring to light your beautiful work and the way that you create this community of sharing and love and contemporary art and and um wanting to just educate and, and celebrate you and your culture, but also trying to encourage people to like, not be afraid to look right. There's just dive in. How, yeah, how much more powerful is it to, in, you know, demonstrate to your students, hey, we're going to talk about this beautiful style of form line painting. And here are five artists that are like, currently working doing amazing things. That's probably going to be more meaningful to them than like, you know, we can talk about the history, of course, but there's always more to it than that, right? Well, and a great way to dive into the history is to look at indigenous art because many of us um, are talking about history through our work. And so yeah. that's a way to have a conversation that is actually can be kind of difficult and painful in some ways, but you can enter it through contemporary art. And I think yeah. that's, you know, um, there are so many, particularly on Instagram, there is a massive native artist community on here. And mm -hmm. there's just cranking out work all the time so you know all you got to do is just be just dab on in and yep. swim around and you're gonna just, basically it's just gonna get worse and worse for you because your entire feed will just fill up with cool made of art <laughs> so, i would say that's better and better i'm not gonna lie <laughs> i started following some amazing beaters recently and i'm like this is awesome i'm obsessed yeah. but this oh, is oh. uh lulu beating bear and oh, it's so, gorgeous like, yeah i mean i i love native makers so much because they're so concerned with quality and craft and so it's just a great um sort of niche art group to pay attention to because they are also just like doing some really interesting things with materials now so yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah. I love it. I love it. So speaking a little bit about um, you and some of the other exhibits that you've been a part of, um, you were telling me, at least when we were chatting before, about the Land Five Oaks Museum and your Kalapoyan um, tribe, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, and how you work together with the museum to correct errors of a display that was in the museum. So can you unpack that a little bit and tell us about what, what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. <laughs> So um, the Five Oaks Museum was originally the Washington County Museum, and um, it was a historical museum that basically celebrated pioneer history. And um, it had this one exhibition that had created about 20, a little less than 20 years ago, essentially, um, about my tribe, but they actually didn't consult anyone from our tribe until it was made. <laughs> and so... <laughs> When they made it, there was a lot of errors in it. There's a lot of right. errors and sort of mischaracterizations, basically. And so it's one of, it was their most popular exhibition, but um, it had a lot of errors in it. And so um, these new directors took over the museum and they were like, hey, we have this exhibition that we made and we don't know if we should show it to anyone because it's problematic. <laughs> And so mm -hmm. they invited me to the museum to look at this exhibition, which is, you know, big museum panels with writing and pictures and very, you know, boring history type looking stuff. And, um, and they said, what should we do? Should we just throw this in the dumpster? <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> no, <Wait. laughs> no, give it to me. And I actually took the exhibition home in my car and um, I, mm -hmm. I stayed with it in my house for like a month and basically went through with a Sharpie and edited and corrected um, the information in those panels and then took them back to the museum. We reinstalled them in the museum. And then we also brought in a bunch of contemporary native art and mixed it all together so that people could learn about the history of my tribe in that area and also learn about contemporary native culture as well. So um, I, it, it was a really cool opportunity because not many museums, particularly historical museums are, um, willing to open themselves up to critique right. and so for me it was an amazing opportunity to work with a really forward-thinking museum that is thinking about rectifying white privilege within that institution and mm -hmm. so we created an exhibition that 
was just recently written by uh, about by Art News and um, was written up by the Oregonian here. So uh, it did very well. It was very well received. And now it's fully digitized, actually. So if anyone who's watching wants to check out the exhibition, you can actually go to the Five Oaks Museum website. And it's fully yes. digitized. So you can see all the artists. And you can also see the panels that I edited and how I wrote over their information. So um, I love it. Please check it out if you can. Um, the exhibition right, it, was called This is Kalapoyan Land. And Kalapoyan is spelled K-A-L-A-P-U-Y-A-N. Love it. Love it. And I love, too, that it tells so much of a story. It's called um, This is Kalapoyan Land, Five Oaks Museum. And I'll actually be sharing that link in the Art of Ed story right after this um, so that you guys can go check out that exhibit and all of Steph's um, corrections and um I mean, wow, what a conversation starter to, to bring up with your students if we're talking about work and museum and history and culture. I mean, to see a piece on display that presumably, like, presumably, like, looks like it's fact, but it's not. And then learning that there, we don't always have to believe and we, and we can question um, something and sort of teaching our students that, too. So, um, Abby, just to quick answer your question, again, it was, this is Ka Kalapoyan Land, K-A-L-A-P-U-Y-A-N, um, and that's from Five Oaks Museum, and I will be linking that as well. It sounds amazing. So, um, Steph, I have just maybe one or two more quick questions for you. The next one is just about, again, art educators that are looking to incorporate a more diverse curriculum without of course, appropriating um, and really being sensitive to that cultural appropriation. Um, but I'm curious if you can tell us about some style, um, some, I mean, some styles, some, some projects, some ideas that you think would be appropriate and okay for educators to talk about in their classroom and create with their students, um, kind of like your hacks about what you said would be all right to talk about with our students, right? Yeah, so um, I, one of the things that we do in Formline is we create patterns, and so mm -hmm. the, and they're geometric patterns, meaning that they're they are um, mirrored on either side. So like sure. you know, just like a circle is mirrored either side, it's the same thing. Um, and right. so basically, it's a very simple simple technique that you can use to create your own little templates for patterns without mm -hmm. um without making the same exact shape that i make with those templates so what mm -hmm. you do is literally just take a piece of paper and fold it in half and draw a shape on one side and cut it out now if yep. you go and look at some of my work you'll see all of the symmetrical shapes those are traditionally cut out so Maybe uh, this? not that one so much. Uh, that one does. These are the ones yeah, I have. All, these ones don't have. Those ones don't have form lines so much in them. I'm like, I was like, these are my favorites, but maybe. <laughs> okay, here's an example. So okay, yes. you cut this eye in half. I yes. made it a little less symmetrical, but it's symmetrical, right? But yeah, you, if you were to cut this shape out in traditional form line, you'd cut this eye out, the white part. That's actually just a paper template that you draw the lines on the outside and inside of. So oh. the, the point is, is that it's basically just a way to make a shape be mirrored on either side. And so mm -hmm. kids can create all kinds of shapes that way and then rearrange them to make their own patterns and like composition. So then mm -hmm. that's another thing that I like to do is to think about composition and shapes are a great, great way to sort of learn how to compose an image is to take mm -hmm. like, a triangle, a square, and a circle and just be like, okay, well, put them on the page. You can put them anywhere you like, really. So, <laughs> and, and what, what is that? What happens when you do that? And yeah. so um, you can talk about proportionality, weight, um, uh, uh, foreground, background, like you can mm -hmm. use shapes to do that. And so geometry is a great way to sort of get the brain thinking about dimensionality, I mm -hmm. think. And so that's part of what I recommend is just like, it's re it's much more simple than people think. Like, the, uh, right. like, okay, perfect example of the woodland style. So the woodland style is all florals. Um, and they're almost like a filigree style to me because there's okay. lots of, like swirls and stuff. So like, observing the style, which is floral. So flowers. Okay, well, let's create our <laughs> own flower patterns 
that don't look like those. And mm -hmm. you can also look at other floral patterns because there are so many throughout um, art history. Like, you know, you can go into the Rococo period or you can go into all these different places and sh bring them together, right? Like yeah. um, make relationships. And so to me, it's, it's more about, like I said, observing the underlying structure or pattern about something and mm -hmm. then using that to inform whatever lesson you create, really, um, like the color theory part, I, I just love to work with color theory because I think that once people know how colors function together, can really like change the way you look at the world in some way. Oh, yeah. Because colors are used to direct our emotions through marketing and all kinds of stuff. So learning <laughs> what color combinations do, how they perform um, emotionally speaking, that's another thing that I love to talk about because uh, one of the things that we did when we first got to art school was to like hear an emotion and then either assign a color or a line to it. So mm. when someone says the word calm, usually the line is like this, you know, and the color is usually blues, greens. Uh, but if you say anger, the, the line is like this and the colors are like reds, you know, um, so <laughs> thinking getting people engaged in those ideas and how they can translate visually, I think is a really interesting way to do things as well. So totally. there's, there's so many ways to be inspired by something and then connect it to other concepts outside of right. just being so centrally focused on the culture or something, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it can be, it can be part of the conversation, but it shouldn't be the only part of the conversation. Right. Right. Um, there is, yeah, <laughs> right. it's like um, it's like we become so isolated from everyone else in 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 people's minds that they don't sure. realize that we are amongst you. You know? <laughs> yes, yes. As always, we right? share space. Humans are yes, exactly, and and uh, need to continue to be respected in that way as artists, as educators, as people, everyone um, together. Right? <laughs> um, okay. Quick question here before we wrap up here with our trivia. Um, an individual here was, rem was saying that, um, one of the lessons is about crows that she's working on and that, um, she believes there is a connection with indigenous art and that bird in particular. Do you know of any resources about that? Or have you ever made any crows yourself, Steph? Or is that um, not your... Yeah, that's a, that's a really general statement and that's not true for every tribe. Um, so it re you, ha you have to get very specific. That's another thing too, is that when you're talking about indigenous people, it's, it's easy to just like talk about them as like a monolith, but actually we're not. And that even tribe, like the two tribes that I belong to actually are very different, even though they weren't separated by very many miles. One of them lived inland and one of them lived on the river near the coast. And so their lives were very different. So were their art. And so mm -hmm. were just like the like literal things that they did from day to day. So, um, it's better to identify a specific culture that you want to talk about within the indigenous umbrella and then see what their beliefs on it are because that's not always the case and um, there can be like weird negative uh, mythological stuff attached to things that really just aren't, it's not true. So um, right. yeah, I, I, I try not to answer those questions. I ask you to go back and research a little bit farther. Thank you for, for answering respectfully. And I think that is great advice as well. Um, p just to, to piggyback off that a little bit too, just because I think that is a big part of what we're discussing today too, is that Steph is a working artist, right? You are an individual who has your own creative voice, who's kind of melding many things together. But the, the main thing that I think hopefully you and I want people to pull from this is the fact that there is uh, a huge way to talk about um, artists and indigenous work and that it takes a little bit of work, important work, but to investigate in order to kind of um, not appropriate and not appropriate and um, be respectful towards everyone, right? Um, so in that vein, before I ask our little trivia question, do you have any parting sort of words of advice um, about either art making or about um, your creation or anything from our chat today that you want people to take away from this discussion, Seth? Uh, I would just say thanks to everyone who actually stayed and listened to all of us. And, <laughs> and honestly, to all the art educators, again, who are listening, I am, 
I am sure there are days when you think you are crazy for doing what you did, but believe, <laughs> believe me that you have most likely saved a life, if not more, and that um, the more space you give to kids to help express themselves, you may not realize that, but some people don't even have the ability to do that in their home environments. And so art can be this way that we learn to have our voice. And um, I'm honestly just learning how to be comfortable with that myself. So I know how, how, um, how much art has helped me do that and how much um, art educators helped me get to where I am today. So um, I just wanna say thank you because I could never say thank you enough. Well, back at you, um, Steph, seriously, when, when I saw your work and saw how you spoke to people, I'm like, oh man, I, I'm so excited to chat with you because you are such an inspiration and so open to discussion, which I really, really appreciate. You are an incredibly beautiful person, educator, artist, and it's it's really uh, my pleasure to be able to chat with you today. Um, so our, <laughs> our last um, little fun thing for the end of our chat is that I have this very metallic, beautiful rainbow sticker for <laughs> um, one individual that can answer a, a trivia question about our chat today in the in the chat, right? So get your typing fingers ready, y'all. Okay. Once I ask the question, it is the first answer that I see that is correct will be, um, I will message you and you can get your hands on the sticker. So here's the question. What tribe does Steph belong to, specifically the one that you had your art show about? What tribe does Steph belong to? Spelling is in the air. Yeah, Take as a long guess as on the spelling. <laughs> yeah, you, to you told me that many people Okay, well, can we count that? Linzers? Californian? I think I'm gonna have to go with pre uh, Precious. Precious, okay. <laughs> okay, close, close, y'all. I know, I didn't see the other ones coming in. All right, my, oh, you guys are, so, thank you for all responding with your, res <laughs> that was a hard one today. I know, I appreciate, I appreciate it. <laughs> no, it's good, we, we wanna learn, we wanna, we wanna be part of it. Okay, Precious Maggot, love this, the name. I shall be messaging you, my friend. <laughs> and we'll get you hooked up with a sticker. Okay, so y'all, we will be sharing, um, we'll be saving this chat with Steph today on our IGTV so you can rewatch it, share it with friends. Um, I will also be sharing some more like links to her website, her shop, um, her, uh, the art display that we were talking about before through Land uh, Five Oaks, through the Five Oaks Museum. Um, so there'll be lots of information in the, the Art of Ed story after this. Steph, thank you so, so, so much. Y'all have a great Monday. Awesome. Thanks. We'll see you later. Bye. Bye.